Today we're going to be looking at how audio cassette player mechanism works, um, running through the basic um, parts, how it operates, and how to fix it as well, um, which obviously is a lot easier once you understand which part is which. Now they come in two basic arrangements. You have your portable stereo type one where the buttons are on top of the unit and the door is on the front and it front loads. The heads are actually on the top. The tape loads into the door upside down and into the mechanism like that. And they also make what is basically the same mechanism the other way around. Um, it'll just have different type of buttons on it, such as this one. This is out of a silver unit from the 80s, silver brand that is, and it's basically the same thing, um, but the buttons operate by pressing down on them, and the cassette mounts in an upright position. Most stereo hi-fi decks are like this, some portable stereos with the door open, you put your tape down into it, with the bottom down, and then shut the door, which would put it in that position. So um, these earlier 80s, um, 70s and 80s cassette players, just about every mechanism is made for that particular model or that particular brand, so they're all different in their construction. Um, you know, the motors are often the same sort of part um, used between different brands, but um, each deck, each mechanism, all the parts in it will generally be incompatible with anything else. Um, into the 90s, uh, this is one of the 90s style decks that kept going right through the 90s and even later. Um, there's basically only two of these sort of generic mechanisms used in a lot of basically portable stereos, shelf systems, that sort of thing. Some hi-fi decks as well. Um, there's this one with this little auto stop lever that moves up and down here. Um, and there's also another one which I haven't got, but I think it had some sort of metal arm that came up here with a little angled off piece which was also for the auto stop um, I'm not sure if these were Chinese made or where they're made but um, most of the later players use one of, or other of those two types of decks um, the only difference with them is depending which way around they're mounted they would put a set of buttons on them um, coming outwards if it was a, a front loading tape bottom down first um, or if it was an upside down mechanism with the buttons at the top in a portable stereo the buttons sticking out the top uh, They had these straight little lever fittings to put the buttons on but that was about all that varied between them um, again Using fairly generic motors the only real difference with these motors Which is usually all labeled on them. This one's a 9 volt DC. They also come in 6 and 12 volt It's about the only ones you normally see um, there's a CCW here on the label, which means counterclockwise. They also come in a clockwise version, CW. Uh, they usually have a, a part number on them, like this is an EG530AD9BT. Um, it also says that it's 2400 RPM, which is the standard speed. I believe most motors are that speed for just a single speed deck. Um, you also get, they just have a positive and negative terminal on them. You also get a four terminal version which has a, a secondary speed which is something like double that 4800 or something as well as 2400 that's used in dual dubbing tape decks for the high speed dubbing but most of them just have these two terminals uh, these later ones have like you can see a bit of circuit board sticking out with the terminals there is an electronic controller in here and there's a little that little hole there which has usually a bit of black foamy stuff over it that's actually a trim pot to adjust the speed of the motor um, some of the earlier motors, such as this one, the wire just comes straight out of it. It's also got a trim pot to adjust it. You can actually see that one in there, it doesn't seem to have a cover. Uh, this is 12 volt DC, again 2400 counterclockwise, EG 5110ED2B. These were common in a lot of the earlier units. Um, yeah, the one in the um, silver deck, that's one of the slightly later looking ones. It's got the circuit board EG 500AD9B, again 9 volts, 2400 counterclockwise. So I think the counterclockwise were the common ones, but some do have a clockwise motor in them. So you need to check that if you ever need to replace a motor. Um, now we'll have a look at some of the main, main parts in these tape decks and what they do. 
Now, you obviously have your two reels, the supply one as it's called, and the take up one. So when you put your cassette in here, that comes through the two holes in the cassette. Um, the supply reel is basically the one that you rewind onto and it also supplies the tape as it plays from the left to the right side here. And the take up reel is the one that takes up the tape after it's played. Now in rewind and fast forward, the motor goes via a little idler assembly here, a little gear assembly, or it can be a rubber tyre. And in rewind, the motor will pretty much directly just drive this uh, supply reel and in a reverse direction, clockwise direction, and none of our heads or anything will be engaged. In fast forward, it'll swing across and engage with a take up reel, which will go in an anti clockwise direction, and that's all that's powering the tape when it's fast forwarding or rewinding. But when we're actually in play, uh, this supply reel just sits here and spins and doesn't do anything. Um, the take up reel does run but it's not actually what's pulling the tape through. When we go into play we actually have the heads which are these two things here, race head, play, back head. They actually move up into the bottom of the tape case here. So that's the heads they're sitting below and the pinch roller on here sitting below the tape when we press play actually goes up inside the tape slightly pushes against the little um the little spring bit of uh, felt in there which actually helps push the tape onto the head so it can read it get the signal off it and the pinch roller engages with the capstan which is a shaft which goes up through this hole in the tape metal shaft here and it's actually the tape being squeezed between the pinch roller and the capstan which actually pulls the tape through when we're in play mode. So that sets the speed and does all the pulling. The um, take up reel here will also turn but that's only to basically once the tape comes out of being pinched between the pinch roller and the capstan it'll just start coming out like you get when you a uh, tape chews. If it just basically comes out of the roller and it's loose so this has to wind it back inside the case but this has really nothing to do with the actual playback um, speed or anything like that it's merely just pulling the tape back into the case so we don't get a chewed tape situation so now we'll have a look at some of the parts removed from a tape deck we have our race head this just has two wires connected to it um, you can see the little ferrite face in it there, the rest of it's just a plastic casing. And basically these are just fed, uh, these are on the left hand side of the, the playback head here. And as the tape goes from left to right spool, if you're in record mode this will be fed an AC bias signal, which will basically erase the old signal off the tape before it gets across to our playback head. Now this is just the playback head. Uh, your normal stereo one, just basically four connections, two earths and two signals, left and right channel. And a couple of mounting tabs, a little bit of a tape guide on the end here. And basically again the ferrite face of the, the little pickup part of the head there. Um, generally these pretty well last for, a long, for the life of the tape deck. You may have to give them a clean occasionally if there's any sort of orangey brown... Uh, tape ferrite uh, oxide that builds up on there. Um, the only other thing that really goes wrong with them is an actual groove can be worn into the face of them if they've had an awful lot of use. The head will actually wear but generally um, they last pretty well. Same with the erase head, very rare for anything to go wrong with them. Um, it is possible to set the alignment on this which we'll look at later but generally it's very rare you ever need to replace a tape head it's basically just a couple of coils of wire in there and um, we can just check these with a multimeter set to continuity. If you are missing a channel or anything like that, if you have any suspicion that there's something wrong with one of these heads, but very rare it'll happen, we can just, there's your race head just across the two pins, continuity, I'd say red and yeah, it looks like the red wires are probably our signal and, and white is our earth so this is not quite as low a resistance even though it is just a coil of wire we've got about 200 ohms 200 ohms and the other windings aren't connected so across these two pins 
is basically just a coil of wire in there and we should get continuity very rare that you ever find a head's gone open circuit or anything like that these are generally very reliable and outlive the life of the cassette deck uh, some of the other important parts we have our capstan this is what it looks like removed from the deck it has this large flywheel on it to I guess help regulate the speed keep it constant and this shaft that comes up this is usually mounted on the back of the deck um, our motor here it's got this pulley on it there'll be a belt one of these rubber belts rubber bands as some people like to call them either a square section or a, a flat section belt which will basically go from our motor pulley across to our capstan there's a slot on the back of this some sort of arrangement like that depending on which way around the motor is and the motor will drive that sometimes it'll have the flat belt which will go right around the face of it and this is what regulates our speed and pulls the tape through in playback mode uh, we have this little pinch roller here just a little rubber wheel mounted on a bracket that pivots back and forth so it engages and disengages with this pin on the actual uh, capstan itself so that'll engage and disengage with that capstan shaft there's usually a big spring on this as well which will so when the tape deck comes up the spring will push this hard against the capstan so that can sometimes cause problems but generally as the capstan rotates the pin roller sits against it and that'll rotate as well pulling the tape through so it's the pressure of these two things together that pulls the tape through in the play mode um, off this will often be another belt which will run to this other assembly known as the idler now this bit swings back and forwards between our two reels so we have our take up and supply reels one one to pull the tape in the forward direction either fast forward or play and one to pull it in the reverse direction and this idler, type, idler assembly will have a belt on the back of it on this pulley so a rubber belt will go around that usually back to the capstan um, sometimes there's one belt around the capstan and the, the idler pulley just depends on the way they've set the deck up um, so this this will this is fairly basically directly dry, driven by belt from the motor and this will run our fast forward and rewind operations depending on which button you press it'll swing back and forwards and connect with either your supply or take up reel um, some of them also will have this little rubber wheel this is our play idler this is actually runs on a, a, a different lever and this is only operated um, onto the take up reel so it only ever pushes against that it can't swing back to the reverse one unless we've got some sort of auto reverse deck or something may may actually have an idler that swings between the two but on just a normal deck non auto reverse one uh, this will just swing across so in the older ones this is just a plastic body and it's got this little rubber tire on it which is falling to bits on this one um, common problem for chewing tapes will be that this little rubber wheel will be worn out they can be quite hard to get these days um, so you may have to find a way of substituting something like an o-ring or something for that if you if you can't get an, a replacement anymore but the later decks did away with this it's just gear driven um, but the, all the early decks often have one or more wheels rubber wheels involved in this which will perish with time so that's sort of the main parts of the deck and how they work um, there's also a little leaf switch mounted on the back so when the mechanism's pressed a bar will slide across in play fast forward and rewind to press on this switch which then gives voltage to operate the motor and get that going so if the motor's not running at all it can be something to do with this switch or the lever that pushes on it um, older tape decks also had a tape counter just a little mechanical counter which as we spin it around it it counts to going the wrong way but anyway it, counts upwards to give you an idea where in the tape you are which is handy if you're recording and stuff and you want to go back to a certain place and it's got a reset button to go back to zero uh, this is also driven off a couple of belts often that'll go back to our take up reel usually i'll have a belt off there off this little groove underneath there and that'll run that in some of the older decks this will also have a magnet and a reed switch or magnet and hall effect sensor something like that 
and if the belt fails between the take up and our tape counter and the tape counter stops running often that'll work as an auto stop and um, if the belt actually fails um, it'll sense that the rotation stopped and go into auto stop even though the tape's still running fine just because the belt is slipping or broken um, so that's another thing to look out for if you've got a tape deck that runs for a second or two and then goes into auto stop that can be usually a belt that feeds the counter and the counter will have on the more expensive units will have some sort of speed sensor or rotation sensor and if that stops rotating that'll activate the electronics to turn the usually using a solenoid or something to actually turn the deck off and put it back into stop mode So here we have the complete deck with all those pieces together. We have a race head on the left, two wires, a play record head, which is usually mounted, well always mounted in the middle I think. If it's an auto reverse type deck you actually have double the, this little dark part you can see in there. It'll have two of those, it'll be right across the face of it. Um, usually car cassette players like that because they just change the direction of the tape. Some of the hi-fi or shelf system ghetto blaster type auto reverses you actually have a gear on the bottom of this head and it will actually rotate the head around. It'll just be a normal stereo head and they'll actually rotate it, use a mechanism to rotate it but you won't find that on these basic sort of generic decks. Um, so in stop mode basically nothing rotates here you can see our idler wheel turning our caps and turning but the switch on the back will be disengaged so the motor won't turn at all when you're in stop uh, if we engage rewind you'll see this idler here has will move across and that'll engage so when the motor turns it'll also hit the it'll press the switch in so this wants to auto stop the motor will start and it'll start turning the the supply reel in reverse in, which is the clockwise direction but that's actually pulling the tape backwards there goes our auto stop uh, if we go to fast forward um, the reel the idle will flick across to the other side to the sub, to the take up reel and that'll turn an anti-clockwise direction and pull the tape the other direction, so in the forward direction. Now once we go into play mode all the heads will engage and the pinch roller has to come up and press on the capstan here so we press play, our heads move up, this whole plate moves up our pinch roller is now engaged so you can see the pinch roller will turn if we turn I'm turning the capstan on the back here like the motor would um, the pinch roller should engage and turn. Now our, our take up reel will also turn but it's not turning via this idler. The idler is just sitting in the middle disengaged now. This one's actually got a separate gear here because in play mode it'll run at a lower speed. We don't want it running at fast forward speed. We just want this to take up the slack tape after it's been pulled through by the capstan and pinch roller. Um, if we press our pause button That'll actually make the pinch roller drop back, so it disengages from pulling the tape through because it's no longer touching the caps, and the caps will keep spinning, but that's just brushing against the tape basically, it doesn't do anything. And you also see that our, our take up reel has disengaged as well. So basically, this, this little gear here, which is driving our uh, take up reel in playback, will just fall back and disengage. Uh, along with the pinch roller when we take that off again our pinch roller will re-engage our uh, take up reel drive will also re-engage now the actual pause button itself is you can see this lever moving up and down it's got a little mechanism little plastic piece can't really see it under the motor there but it's got a little latching piece there a little plastic bit uh, that'll hold it in place sometimes those are, they're held on by these little a little white plastic clip with a spring under it sometimes those crack and will pop off the spring will pop that plastic bit off and you'll find if the pause isn't working you may find that little plastic round clip there plus a spring floating around inside the mechanism sometimes also the little latching plastic piece there will fall out as well um, sometimes also the little 
part in that plastic there's a little piece in the middle which holds the pause button down that'll actually wear out or break off and even though the parts are in place it just won't latch the pause button down uh, we hit stop again and everything disengages the only other button is our record button here now the record button is connected to this lever here which corresponds with the hole in the top of the tape here or if it has a hole if it's a pre-recorded tape that tab will be missing and that means that this lever doesn't get pushed which means you cannot you try and push your play record down you cannot do it whereas if we have a tape like this which has a tab in it this is a a blank tape purchased as a blank tape then that will actually push this lever up which will lift it up off this lever and we can then engage our play and record buttons together um, in this mode it's basically everything's the same as being in um, playback we have our pin roller engaged, our take up reel running slowly, our heads engaged but um, the only difference is this will, there's a mechanical lever on the back this can be a wire lever, this one's a just a, a right angle piece of metal but they will push on a, an actual uh, play record switch on the circuit board in the tape deck so that is the main difference which will then electrically connect the heads up differently it'll get the erase head erasing give that a bias signal and obviously the playback head will then be getting a signal in it to record rather than then to playback but um, mechanically record is basically the same thing other than it presses an electrical switch and it also is stopped from actuating by a record protect lever there so we put our tape in press play heads go up pin roller engages if I wind the capstan you can actually see the tape moving if we actually I'm not sure this will probably try and disengage if we stop this take up reel from engaging then the pinch roller will will still keep turning and that will cause a tape chew because the tape will go through the pinch roller where it's pressed against the capstan and start coming out the back of the pinch roller Sometimes it'll follow, it'll stick to the pin troll and get, follow it around and then get all jammed up in the mechanism. So if you have a chewing tape issue, it means your pin troll is working and capstan, they're pulling the tape through but this uh, take up reel has stopped rotating and pulling the tape back into the case. So that's what causes that. Uh, in record mode, because this has got a tab in it, the record's disengaged it's exactly the same thing mechanism operates mechanically identically but there's there would be a switch pressed inside the on the circuit board of the actual unit or sometimes it's a, a mechanical lever uh, that pulls on the switch and that changes all the electrical signal going to the heads and um, basically starts erasing the tape as it comes past your erase head off the supply reel and then a blank piece of tape will get to the record head as it now is the record playback head and that'll write a new signal onto the tape for you and record that there here is our older style mechanism 1980s silver boom box and it's basically the same operation the buttons just operate on a slightly different principle because they're sticking out the front in this case but you can see that lifts up our heads that's the play button connects our pinch roller to our um, capstan shaft and this little idler little rubber idler tire in this one comes across and our supply our take up reel starts rotating to pull the tape back into the case uh, that's the stop button um, we've got another mechanical uh, geared idler here that when we're going to rewind that pulls across to the supply reel when you press fast forward it swings back across to the take up reel when we press stop it just sits there and does nothing when we press play it is actually connected i think in this case so it is actually running the play idler so some in some cases the play idler will run just off this little protruding much smaller diameter part which will reduce the speed but um, that's basically how it works. We've also got this eject lever here. That's what opens your door. 
sometimes they're usually sprung like this when we press the stop button a second time that'll eject and the spring on the door will push the door open sometimes you'll get some trouble with these will jam and the spring may break off so they don't return so the door stays open and when you're trying to shut it it doesn't stay shut sometimes something will go wrong and you won't be able to open the door because when you press on this it doesn't lift this part uh, so that's another thing that can go wrong but this is this mechanism is very much the same as the other one uh, except we have a single belt in this one that comes off the pulley, sh pulley on the motor round our capstan round our idler which you can see can swing within that belt even pulling on the belt a bit and then back onto the motor so it's just a loop around whereas our other one here we have a belt loops around just the capstan and then we have a second belt from the another little pulley on the capstan below there which comes across to our idler so there's there's multiple different ways they set these belts up but um if if either of these these belts break if the one going to the motor breaks then you'll find you have nothing on the tape deck will actually operate you'll be able to mechanically put it in place but it won't rewind fast forward or do anything um, if this secondary belt breaks you'll usually lose rewind and fast forward um, but play may still work or depending on the design it may actually chew tapes because the take up reel will no longer take up but the but the the capstan will still run and the pinch roller so you'll get those rotating but not this and that is a common cause for chewed tapes um, about the only other thing we haven't covered on these is the auto stop this particular type of 90s mechanism which is one of the generic ones used in lots of different brands and basically replaced many except for the high-end brands all the decks were either this one or the the slight variant of it um, so we have this auto stop piece here that as as the reel turns it's actually pivots up and down slightly on this eccentric center of this gear here and as long as this reel is turning there is a little piece mounted on here a double-ended little piece that can swing either way and as long as that's pressing down with a little bit of pressure because the reel is turning that'll stop the auto, auto stop engaging but as soon as we stop this or nearly as soon as we do yeah actually we've got to stop the gear uh, do i have to stop the gear no that's going to make a liar of me it's not engaging oh there it goes so it usually happens quite a bit quicker than that and same if we're going to rewind without this supply reel the take up reel operating it'll soon go into auto stop in fast forward again we have to stop this centerpiece and you can see it click there a bit but it hasn't taken it out yet once it does a full revolution you now i think it actually has it just hasn't slid back probably so in play mode again if this this part stops turning within a revolution of this it should uh basically the, this mechanism will flick something and unlatch the main mechanism so the heads will come back pinch roll will disengage the switch will open and the motor will stop um probably one uh, one other thing we should cover is there is a bit of a clutch here in this this is the fast forward and rewind idler which feeds this gear and under this piece here on the back where the belt goes on there's a little felt pad so there is a bit of a clutch in there so that when the tape hits the end before the auto uh, auto stop actually kicks in or if you've got a bad tape that's jammed up or something there is a little bit of slippage allowed between the belt running this outer piece and the gear on this inner inner one so if that suddenly comes to a screeching halt at the end of the tape just before that kicks in that'll allow the the motor the clutch will slip so you won't break a tape or anything like that um occasionally these you'll get problems with these clutches sometimes they're just worn out but it, it takes a lot of use normally for that to happen sometimes this gear which is on a metal pin will split the plastic will crack and that'll come loose and won't 
Uh, it's not attached to the pin anymore, so that'll just slip instead of driving anything. Um, if people have put oil or grease or um, uh, like a, a lubricant RP7 or something like that into the unit and it gets on that clutch pad, which is like a felt pad in there, that'll slip and that can ruin the clutch. So that can be another problem if you fast forward or rewind slow or not operating or doesn't get to the end of the tape, it can be that clutch slipping uh, long before it should because it's just not, not enough friction there because someone's lubricated it or it's worn or yeah, your little gears split, something like that. Um, the auto stop mechanisms occasionally you'll get something wrong with those. A spring that pulls this unit will, will unhook or something will break. Um, they're generally pretty reliable, but sometimes you will have to try and work out how this unit works. If you're getting auto stop occurring all the time, basically press play and within a revolution of the reel, the, the deck just cuts off again. Um, but generally fairly reliable. Uh, sometimes you'll get faults with these, these slide bars. There's a whole bunch of sliding bits that go sideways as well as these levers that go up and down. Um, you can probably see some of it through the holes in the chassis there. Um, they're all hidden hidden under this plastic part and the heads, but they can sometimes cause trouble, sometimes because someone's bent something here. Maybe one of the little levers sticking up like the one that presses on the switch is bent and it's not pressing the switch. Um, it's generally pretty reliable, those parts. Sometimes they can, you know, if they haven't been used for a very long time and it's an old deck, they might need lubrication. There is a bit of grease on some of these. But um, generally, never go and put lubrication of any sort all over a tape deck. Uh, it's the best way to ruin them. If you can apply it in areas where there is grease or there is oil on some of the little bearings and stuff, on, like on the capstan, on the reels, but don't just put lubricant all over everything thinking it'll fix it because it'll probably ruin the deck. Um, you may need to lubricate some of these things. If it's really old, it may even need um, some sort of lubricant spraying in there very, very sparingly and cautiously just to loosen things up again. Um, sometimes there's things like these springs here on a little plastic mount. The plastic mount will break. So always check for springs that are not sitting right or if they've fallen out and in the bottom of the unit somewhere. They can cause problems because a lot of them are sitting on plastic and stuff that will break. Um, if you get really desperate you can take these screws out on the back here on these newer decks and probably on most decks and actually remove this whole head unit. You'll probably have to take the pin roller off and possibly the capstan and a few and this uh, auto stop and stuff but they are a real pain to work on um, with these later generic decks. Um, yeah, if it had a problem in the, in the mechanism that wasn't something obvious, I'd just find another second hand deck out of another unit, preferably one that hasn't had much use and has been written off for other reasons, and just um, swap the whole deck over. You'd probably have to put the original motor back in it, and sometimes the original heads, you just unscrew them and leave them because they're on the original wiring or whatever. But you could actually just change the whole deck over because it can be a real pain once you pull that to bits. It's very hard to to see what, what's actually faulty for starters and very hard to get everything back together again often everything's loose in there you've got to try and keep everything in place and then it engages with all sorts of different things here and yeah very hard to get it all working again so generally wouldn't recommend pulling that to bits um, some of these earlier decks are much simpler you can see everything the whole play part on, is on the front here it all slides up and down but it's just one unit springs are obvious what it does is obvious on the back here there's very little as well just a few bits that slide up and down and then this latching plate that as you press each button this will come across and just lock the button in when you press the stop button that just slides back and everything falls back into place so these are quite easy to work on some of these old ones if you ever need to fix the mechanics in them but generally they're very reliable other than problems with your idler tires belts Sometimes pinch roll is not engaging properly, um, that sort of thing. Eject mechanism not working properly, but um, generally they're pretty reliable. Now when the unit is put into record, I was talking about a record playback switch. It's usually mounted on the circuit board somewhere. It's this big long silver thing here, which is how these white or black plastic ends. If we press on that, it slides back and forwards. 
So normally that just in play, that just sits in the resting position, the internal spring pushes it to one end. Uh, when we press record, there'll be some sort of mechanical linkage or lever will push that across. And that'll then kick in all this electronics to rewire the heads to become record instead of play. Um, there'll be some sort of little oscillator here with one of these coils usually that does your um, erase head, puts an AC signal into that so it becomes basically a demagnetizer of the tape signal, just puts a random magnetic pattern there in place of whatever was recorded on it before. Now these do cause problems, usually the, the tape deck will be pressing on it alright, but sometimes when you've got absolutely no playback sound or no record sound, um, or it could be one channel missing, one channel intermittent, the actual contacts in these do get dust and dirt in there especially if they haven't been used much so what you'd normally do is get something like a can of this switch cleaner lubricant and basically go in on the ends and the hole in the middle make sure it all comes bubbling out nicely and give a good good dose of switch cleaner lubricant and then flick it back and forwards a heap of times just to work that in there and that'll usually solve the problem um, if you've got an old tape that just has your own recordings on it you're not worried about the recording getting erased on it you can actually give this a, a push back and forwards while you're playing the tape and you'll hear all sorts of crackling and stuff quite often until you give it a good good dose of cleaner and then it should become quiet but each time you press it in the record position it will actually record onto the tape and at least erase whatever you have on there so it will mess up your recording but at least you can actually hear it live hear if it's making crackling sounds and things dropping in and out which is a good sign the the contacts are dirty on it but generally they can fail these switches but generally they just need a good clean and lubrication if they haven't especially if they haven't been used for a long time and that'll get those working again for you so now i have this deck that i was showing you before actually plugged back into a, a portable cassette player so just on the motor side, I haven't bothered plugging the heads back in yet. So now I can actually see when we press play. Um, there's our take-up reel running fine. Um, you can check these with your finger. Just see they should have a reasonable amount of torque on them. So they're fairly hard to stop. Even when you do stop them, there is a bit of a clutch in these as well. The, the central part that goes up, the sprocket bit that goes up into the cassette will stop. But this outer gear should keep turning if there's no problems um, if the whole thing stops easily then it means usually you've got a slipping belt or a slip, slipping rubber idler tire or some problem with these gears so so it's always good to check that and the auto stop will click in when i do that and fast forward same thing we've got a direct drive from the idler through a couple of gears to the gear on the, the take up so that should be fairly hard to stop again you know eventually that clutch will slip there if i hold it tight enough you can actually see the clutch slipping um, if if the belt's slipping easily then the belt needs replacing uh and rewind's going to cut out because of the auto stop which also i hold that button down but again we just check for a decent amount of torque there we can see if our clutch stops the belt keeps turning there but the clutch will stop so you can actually check them with your hands so just make sure these have a reasonable amount of torque on them uh, also in playback want to make sure that this pinch roller starts turning um, if there's not enough pressure there the pinch roller won't turn and um, yeah often the t if there's enough talk to get the tape turning with this it'll actually speed the tape up it'll go fast um, so occasionally you'll get problems with the pinch roller not pushing down properly occasionally you'll get it covered in some sort of sticky muck so it may chew tape so even if this um, take up reels working if it does that there's usually something sticky all over the pinch roller so give that a clean um, as part of a normal service you'd clean any of this brown stuff brown oxide off the tape off the capstan shaft and also off the pinch roller best to get those cleaned um, same with the heads faces of the heads you just clean any brown oxide off those if there's any on there and any dust anything like that other than that the decks are normally pretty self you know maintenance free 
the grease may need doing on something if it hasn't been used in a long time but generally they don't need oil or grease um, unless they're a really old unit in that case you might find your capstan if that doesn't spin freely that needs a bit of light oil uh, on the shaft where it goes through the bearing or bushing through the through the deck there um, also you may want to take these uh, reels off which the, I'm not sure how these ones come off on these modern ones I think they're clipped on somehow the earlier ones have a little plastic circlip type thing on the end you can take that off um, yeah this one's set up like that so it has a couple of little clips on the end here little plastic clips you take them off and the reel will come off and you can just lubricate the shaft again with some light grease or oil but um, basically yeah if you're checking a deck the first thing you want to do is check that when you press play, rewind, fast forward that the motor actually starts. So when we do that, we press this little switch here. As you can see, if I press that switch, the motor starts. So if you're not getting your motor even starting, um, you always got to check the pulley. If the belts are broken or something, the motor will run. You can usually hear it running. Um, if not, just put your finger or something, just touch the pulley and make sure that is turning. Um, if it's not, then the first thing we need to do is basically check the voltage on our motor. If we press play or fast forward, which one's play? That one. Then we should have our, in this case, a bit over 10 volts. It's a 9 volt motor, so it's probably a little high, but that should be alright. Um, it's got a speed regulator in it, so... It's not going to worry it too much, so the first thing you do is check that you've got voltage on your motor. Um, probably should put the multimeter where you can see it. So yeah, we've got 10 volts on the motor. Uh, if you've got your 10 volts on the motor but the motor's not running well, you've got a faulty motor. Uh, again, like I say, just check that the pulley's not actually turning. You can take the motor off the mechanism and just uh, press play or whatever, press the switch. Get your voltage back on the motor and just feel the pulley see if it's going if it's not try giving it a spin if it's tight it might just need a lubrication um, but if it's just doing nothing if it's freely turning and and you've got your voltage 12 volt 6 volt 9 volt whatever the motor is uh, then you've got a dud motor something in the circuit boards failed the brushes something like that so it's time for a new motor um, the other thing you'd also check is the switch Occasionally they will fail. I'm on the negative of the motor here, so we should have a positive. Yeah, our 10 volts is coming through on the switch. Um, if we turn the power off. If you think this, if you're not getting a voltage on the motor, then the first thing you check is the switch. Put it into play, or press the contacts order, and we should have continuity there. So that's a short circuit. If that's not a short circuit. Um, then probably got burnt contacts pretty rare that happens but it's possible something's wrong with the actual contacts there the other thing of course is to check that the contacts are actually being pushed by this little metal lever in this case when we press play you'll see this the contacts bend across because this lever pushes on it when we press rewind fast forward etc that levers across so first check that it's mechanically being pressed if it is and there's no continuity and no voltage on your motor then you've got a faulty switch um, very rare that happens, but it can do. Um, but if we've got voltage here, and it's getting through the motor, and we don't have a motor rotating, the motor's faulty. Um, if we haven't got any voltage here, any voltage on the motor, or any voltage on the switch, then you've got a fault further in the unit. Um, something in between this, you should go straight back to the main B plus in the power supply. So it could be breaking the circuit board or something like that. Um, but generally there's not much in the way of regulators or anything else uh, in between um, if the radio is running the tape should be running again very rare that anything goes wrong with that section usually you'll find it's got mechanical problems the motor will run but something will be slipping a belt will be broken a belt will be slipping idler etc so that's the main problems you'll find with these sometimes like I say pinch roller won't contact properly um, yeah, sometimes you'll get issues with the reels or auto stop, but generally they're pretty reliable. Uh, another thing that happens occasionally is the record button will be broken because someone's forced it down when this lever's trying to stop it because there's no tab in the tape. So it's just a matter of checking the mechanics there to see if someone's broken something. 
and also if you stop eject if this lever isn't moving because the door isn't opening or the door's staying open then you need to check this lever it can can be that the spring's not pulling it back or it's the grease is dried and it's jammed in the open position so when you shut the door it'll just come straight open again um, can be more annoying when it actually gets stuck and won't open the door because a lot of these units you have to open the door to get the cover off so sometimes you've got to sneak a screwdriver or something in start opening the case and try and push this lever to get the door open so you can actually get inside to fix it so I've got the tape deck back inside the actual unit and the speakers hooked back up so if we press play this is actually working all right we should have get a tape that you know this is an old one so i don't really know the songs on this one but best to get one that you do know the songs on uh, so you can soon tell if they sound all right or not um, check the fast forward check the rewind try the play out make sure that's working um, Um, like I say, if we don't have enough pinch roll or pressure, we'll actually get something like this. Oh, now the auto stops kicked in. So if you've got wow and flutter or high speed, that can be lack of pinch roll or pressure. Usually something mechanically is stopping it from pushing in. Um, we could have lost the spring that holds it in. Sometimes there's a little clip on there and that'll break off if it's plastic. But um, yeah, generally just give everything a check over and yeah, make sure your auto stop also works when it gets to the end of a tape. Uh, we can also, should you go to radio or something and actually check that your play record works. This is just an old unit so I've never used it before. See if I can find an FM station here somewhere. Doesn't look like it. So the radio may not even be working on this one. Ooh, doesn't sound too good. Okay, I've got the radio working on this. So just the switches are pretty dicky in this old unit. God knows when it was last used. Certainly hasn't been looked after. So we should always check that our record, if we've ever played anything, rewind the tape and try record out make sure the record button actually engages and try recording a bit of radio or the like um, to make sure that our record playback switch is working that when we put the deck back in place we've actually put the levers in the right spot so that it actually engages now i'll go back to tape and hopefully we've recorded something as poor as the reception is, there it is. Better stop that before I get a copyright claim, but but that is always a final te test on these things. Always make sure you check your record is working uh, just on an old blank tape, because in, often when you put the decks back in, it may not align properly with the record playback switch. So you always want to make sure that that works, especially if it's like you're doing repair for other people. You don't want them to get their unit home and find out that they can't record anything because you didn't put the switch back right or the lever back to push the switch. Uh, it always pays to check the switch too. Um, like I said, I don't know if I can reach this one, but oh yeah, there's the lever. So I can actually flick that back and forwards even while we're in playback mode. And... Um, and just get an idea what it's what it's like and that clicking is fine as long as it's not making lots of scratching sounds and coming and going then it should be all right um, yeah so that one should be fine in this unit I mean this is only an old unit I'm not going to be restoring this or anything it's just a good demonstration so you can see how these things work okay we'll just give this unit show you how to clean a tape deck um, Guess we should pull the deck out of the unit here make it easier to see so basically we've got to clean everything in the, what is called the tape path which is basically what the tape touches so we've got a race head playback record head a pinch roller and our caps and shaft so 
Again, we can use some methylated spirits on a cotton bud for this. Uh, isopropyl alcohol is even better, but it doesn't have to be that pure for these things. So you basically just rub your cotton bud over the face of the, the entire silver face on the silver head, the playback head. Same with the entire face of the erase head. Uh, the capstan, we need to go up and down and rotate that. Removing everything, just basically polishing it back to bare metal, shiny silver metal again. This one's luckily coming off easily. Sometimes if they're really badly coated, you might have to use a little bit of scour or something like that just to get the worst of it off. That's what I used to use on VCRs because some of the older ones it was near impossible to get the, the oxide off. And then the pinch roller, you need to hold that, stop it rotating and just rub back and forwards on the surface. Then you can push it around a bit further with the cotton bud. And again, just rub the surface to get it back to the black rubber. Spin it around again. Keep rubbing on there. And we just work our way around the pinch roller, the whole face of it. Until we've got that all clean, which I seem to have done. Just let the metho dry off and check if you've got it all. So that's good enough. So that's the basic all we've got to do to clean a tape deck. You can do that through the door while the unit's still together. Uh, it just makes it a little bit more difficult. Um, you can use the cotton bud to, like I say, push the pin roll around. You won't be able to hold it. You might could always use a screwdriver or something, but you don't really want to be poking metal into the face of it. But just you can move it around and just rub back and forwards. You should be able to get the worst of it off there. Capstan just do it and then you may have to hit play or something just to spin it to get it in a different position rub all the oxide off it and may have to press play or fast forward or rewind even but well actually that yeah that'll spin the capstan but any of the buttons just give it a quick push and it'll spin around until you've got the whole face of that clean and that's basically how you clean a tape deck a bit of a gimmick from back in the 80s 70s and 80s was this thing known as a tape head demagnetizer it's basically similar to a degaussing coil used on a television. This is an old Tandy one. Tandy being Radio Shack in Australia. Um, so basically this little metal bit out the end will demagnetise the head. I don't think it ever really made much difference. It was always possible the head could become demagnetised. That uh, could become magnetised. But um, I'm pretty sure these are made out of stainless steel. Uh, there is some ferrite in there usually and copper wire. But the copper wire and the stainless steel isn't going to get magnetised. Possible the ferrite could. But all you did was plug this into the 240 volts and just rub that across the face. You can feel it vibrating 50 hertz hum, basically. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you can get these things anymore. But um, like I say, a bit more of a gimmick than anything, I think. But this was something you could do back in the day. Um, if you had a repair shop, it's possible a customer would ask to have that done. Um, but yeah, I don't think I ever actually had anyone ask to do it. And um, yeah, really, decks that have had an awful lot of use, it might be worth doing it. But really, like I said, I don't think it it did anything much useful. But that is another thing from the old days of cassette player repair. And these are actually a consumer item you could buy. If you're a hi-fi buff or whatever, you might want to do it just for the sake of it. But um, it's just an interesting old bit of the past there. And this was my dad's old one. Um, which I've inherited, but um, yeah, can't say I've ever really used it. It's more just a bit of a interesting old item from back in those days. Okay, now we'll have a look at the actual speed of the unit. Let's check the motor speed's correct. Um, so I've got a test tape here with a one kilohertz signal on it. Uh, I've got a frequency counter here set up. That's actually I've hooked it back to the earth on this pot here, just using an oscilloscope probe. I've got the probe pushed onto one of the resistors, it's the headphone socket. I've actually disconnected the speakers because we don't want to particularly hear that one kilohertz whining away. So if we press play on the tape here, we should get some sort of reading. And this is actually a little bit slow, we're going at 985 hertz. When this should be a one kilohertz signal on this tape. So what we need to do is get to our motor on the back here uh, there's that little hole in it which I can just get in the shot there 
and we use a little small precision type screwdriver go into that hole you should be able to feel that going to the slot of a potentiometer in there little trim pot and we'll adjust our speed until we're reading one kilohertz on the frequency counter there so I've got my screwdriver in there yeah we're going up just give it a very gentle little adjustment and yeah 1001 that's probably close enough um, be nice to get it exactly right but I don't know if it's is going to tweak up and down by one or two hertz and give it a ever so slight whoops sometimes if you short the pot to the case it'll make the motor speed up but yeah that's around the thousand thousand and one there so I think we'll call that good enough so yeah, something's going on here the frequency is dropping I'm probably touching something here so yeah we're settling right on a thousand there so it's something you can do, you don't normally really need to do it, but if you've got a good hi-fi unit, it's probably worth just checking for the customer if you're repairing one, or for your own sake if you own one. Uh, also, if you ever have to replace a motor in one of these, um, the speed could be set to anything on the new motor. Um, so best to just check it again when you put, install it. Put one of these test tapes in, you could make your own test tape if you've got a good deck that you know is correct speed you could just record a one kilohertz signal out of a frequency generator or something a signal generator or you can buy this was a professional one you can actually buy back in the day I don't know if you know, Wes Components used to sell these Wagner Electronics in Australia which is still going so that's their retail arm you might be able to still get these but um, yeah, it's always something worth checking in these tape decks is um, what the actual frequency looks like the tape might have moved on to the next next thing there because uh, our one killer it seems to have ended but um, that's another test we can do um, we'll also have a look at doing the head alignment again that shouldn't need doing if it hasn't been touched it would have been set in the factory and it shouldn't have changed but um, if you ever have to replace the head or like I say sometimes you'd swap the whole deck over with another one because it was too much too much of trouble to fix the old one if it had a mechanical problem one of these newer cheap generic decks so you'd actually swap the deck and it usually is just to put the old heads back back in on the new mechanics a new mechanism so you'd have to realign your head in that case or if you replaced a worn or faulty head which again very rare you ever had to do it but it is worth looking at how you can set the azimuth um, like I say you can do it by ear and just tweak tweak it on a bit of music or even on a, on a test tone to try and get the highest uh, get the high frequency sounding as clear as possible um, but there is a proper way we can do it with a, you know, oscilloscope and a test tape like this where you get a sine wave off it so I'll have a look at doing that as well okay we're going to set the um, azimuth alignment on the head here that's the head, head alignment with the tape uh, what, what angle it sits on so we need a, a, a basically some sort of sine wave recorded on a tape I've just got using the one kilohertz here um, on this test tape uh, we have our oscilloscope set up, two channels, uh, they hook to the both stereo channels left and right. Um, I've got my Crow Probe, I've, there's a couple of hundred ohm resistors down near the speaker connector here and the headphone socket, so I've just hooked onto those because I know there'll be audio there, they just drop the signal lower for the headphone socket. Uh, I've got my Crow, Crow Probe uh, connected under one of them. Um, I use a volume potentiometer case as an earth point. I couldn't find my other probe for the oscilloscope because I've packed it away somewhere and haven't used it for 15 years or something so um, I've just hooked an RCA lead up with a couple of clip leads so to both channels so if we get our one kilohertz playing here you'll see we've got two waveforms if I move the position of one that's our two stereo channels and um, there is a slight amplitude difference here for some reason maybe something to do with the volume control uh, not sure what that is something in this unit is slightly out in the audio section because when we put our two waveforms on top of each other there is a slight amplitude difference here uh, I'm pretty sure the crows are all set right in the oscilloscope but for some reason here yeah, we've got the slight amplitude difference but we're not too worried about that at the moment we're going to do the azimuth now to do the azimuth you need to adjust the head um, the playback head 
This will be mounted usually I think on the right side of them or left side in these upside down decks. There's just a mounting post that's a solid bit of plastic or or um, metal. So you can't adjust that one. The screw just screwed down tight and the head's held in. Whereas the other side here, it's actually the head is mounted on a, a another sort of mounting post but it has a spring in it. Um, so as you adjust the screw in and out, the head actually is pushed up and down by that spring. And that's what actually sets our, our azimuth adjustment, our head alignment. Uh, you can set it manually just for the highest frequencies to sound the clearest. will usually get you by if you're just doing a rough alignment. Uh, but if you want to do it properly, we really need to play a stereo uh, sine wave of some sort. We can even spread that out a bit further to make it a bit clearer. And if we adjust this screw, this is usually held on with a bit of Loctite or something, so you need to break that. Uh, as we're screwing it, I guess, upwards, or is that inwards? You'll see that those two channels separate, and as we tweak it a bit more, they come in to sit on top of each other, so that's the, the timing of the two channels. If the head's a bit out, I guess one's red a bit later than the other, and if we go too far, they come apart the other direction. So our aim is to get those two waveforms to exactly align. Um, if we had like a better quality tape deck, there's a bit of vibration in there for some reason. Might just be picking up some hum on this lead I've got. Um, yeah, if we've got a high quality tape deck, there will actually be trim pots on the board to set your actually amplitudes as well in record and playback. So you can get those while you're in here, you can tweak your amplitude pots to get those to exactly the same height so they sit exactly on top of each other. This isn't too far out, there is a slight, one channel slightly louder than the other. And yeah, for some reason my azimuth seems to be affected a bit by where I sit this. But um, basically we get those two, so the middle of the waveform is completely in, align with, in alignment with the other one. Oh, have we changed to a different note? something just pressed on something there so i had to put it out for a bit but yeah so you get your two waveforms so they're completely aligned now we've run out of one kilohertz signal get those aligned on top of each other in time which is this middle sort of crossing point should be in alignment sitting on top of each other any sort of gap in those is some sort of that's slightly better some sort of time lag there because uh, the head's not on the right angle to the tape and like I say with a with a portable stereo or something you won't have any other adjustments to do uh, but if it's a hi-fi type component tape deck you should have some output levels so you can get these the, the top and bottom of the waves equal on each channel so that both of them when we tweak them using the position on the oscilloscope they should both the peaks and troughs should basically um, align exactly in height as well as the azimuth being across the screen so that the two waveforms are completely on top of each other at this central point and yeah, if the amplitudes are set the same they'll be completely on top of each other and look like a single waveform when you've got everything lined up properly.